So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait. This is not uncomfortable, but it's very weird. This is the thing? This is the one. Absolutely. And now it almost couldn't have happened in a better way. Where did you want to be? So it was just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> am I funny? Now if I go over here, am I still funny? Better strategy. Yeah, no way better strategy. I never thought about that. Yes, it worked. I don't see in five years from now that you're not my most famous friend. You really have to commit to something. Good to have some of the That's cool. That was really cool. Yeah, it might be cool. This is On The Cusp. Hello, I'm Ben Green and welcome to On The Cusp. This week my guest is Paul Welsh. Paul is a member of the UCB House Improv Team JV and he's appeared on TV shows like Key and Peele, Children's Hospital, and Broad City. And also a fun fact, Paul is 100% fluent in Italian. Did you know that? For new listeners, On the Cusp is an interview show where I talk to people in the LA comedy community. People who are on the cusp of very cool things. You can find the complete library of my past interviews on SoundCloud, on Stitcher, and on iTunes. And I hope you'll subscribe to the show. This week's episode of On the Cusp is sponsored by Thai Pepper, home of the best Thai food in Los Angeles. We're also sponsored by the new children's picture book, How to Keep Your Helicopter, which I both wrote and illustrated. Uh, I guess it's a little bit of a stretch to say that the book is actually sponsoring us. It's more that I just want to plug the book and let you know that I think that you should seriously consider getting a copy for a special child in your life. Uh, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the book, and more than that, a bunch of just silly little pictures, and uh, I hope you'll check it out. You can look at more about the book at howtokeepyourhelicopter.com. So, my guest today is Paul Welsh, and I'm sitting here with Marcy Giraud. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Marcy, how long have you been friends with Paul? Uh, I met Paul in a advanced class, so I probably don't know about nine years. Back in New York. Back in New York, maybe eight or nine years. But we became friends in L.A. because I didn't know him very well. I thought I was a quiet, shy person. I was very wrong. <laughs> well, when did you start learning that he wasn't quiet and shy? Uh, we always, uh, once we moved to L.A., we every Thanksgiving we have spent, except for one uh, at Joe and Ashley Spellman's uh, Thanksgiving, or jo Ashley Hill, uh, now, now it's Spellman, um, uh, cause they got married. Uh, so we spent Thanksgivings together and it was always a long day. And so I think just spending a family holiday with someone makes them quickly become way more familiar. And we had the funniest thing happen. This is, oh, I think we were on Cooper when this happened, but we went to the Ralphs on Hollywood, which is the, the worst place to go. And we were picking up one last item on Thanksgiving Day, and a homeless man just walked up to Paul and with his two fingers walked them across his chest. And this is not a story that makes Paul seem great, but I've just never seen him get so upset because he's a very <laughs> cool and compo composed Paul. A composed. Um, he's a very composed person. So, and he just said, no, you do not do that. And that was it. But it was in such a, like a, like a tone, like he was reprimanding a dog. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. It was one of the funniest things. And to this day, I would still walk up to him and just walk my hands across his chest. Uh, so people are about to hear this interview that I did with Paul. Why do you think they should want to listen? What makes well, <laughs> Paul <laughs> worth <laughs> listening to about? Uh, well, Paul is maybe my, he, he's up there in my top three favorite people in my whole life. Wow, that's pretty good. Uh, it was pretty, and I know a lot of great people. Uh, he's, he's definitely one of those people that I agree with everything he says, and if I don't, I feel like I'm wrong about something. So I trust him so much. Uh, and he's so, he's really nice, too. Like, Paul's the kind of guy, once I had, like, m money trouble, like, uh, so I had an account problem and like all my money got cleared out. Like it was a mistake, but Paul offered like to give me money. And I was like, that's so weird for, I mean, nice for a friend who like, Paul like does okay, but he's not like a, you know, he's, he's not like one of our famous friends yet. So I was just like, that's really nice of him. And he's always good for an airport ride. 
and he always subs for me. Like, we just, he has my back. You can tell a lot about a person if they're willing to do an airport ride. Constantly, and we're, we're air, airport buddies. But he's just, like, one of the best people out there. And I, I would be, you would be hard-pressed to find someone who had something bad to say about him. I think, anyway. I've never met anybody who No, did. he's the best. Even when he, like, talks a little shit, it's still, like, so well thought out and fair. Yeah, I feel like uh, I'm with you. There were parts of this episode where uh, he started to say something that wasn't, like, immediately my mindset. And by the time he was done, I had come around. Yeah, he really (laughs) has, like, a, a brain that can quickly calculate so many factors and things and truly understand a bigger subject just so fast. He's just smart, I guess. That's Really smart. Maybe I just haven't been around that many <laughs> very, very smart people, and he has the vocabulary that can back it all up. Uh, so for a little country bumpkin, I'm like, I'm so <laughs> impressed by that man from Connecticut. <laughs> Me too. Does he talk about his brothers at all in this episode? Because yeah, I, I love uh, Rich Paul, Chip, and Chad. <laughs> I don't think they ever get names. Well, they're Rich Paul, uh, Chip, and Chad. But thank you for <laughs> giving them. So, uh, guys, uh, here is my interview with Paul Welsh, uh, and you'll get to hear more about his brothers, Rich Paul. Well, he's named Paul. Paul. Oh, no. <laughs> Rich uh, Paul's a second. Chip and Chad. <laughs> here we go. I didn't have, think I have no idea where you were born originally. I'm guessing it's in the East Coast. But it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm originally from a place called New Fairfield, Connecticut. New Fairfield, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family in like Bethel, and Connecticut. Bethel's close. Is it? Yeah, Fair because mm-hmm. Fairfield is not far from like Danbury. Close. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think Bethel. We used to swim Bethel. Does Bethel have a high school? Yeah. It's bad for me not to. It definitely know. has a high school. Um, yeah, I think we used to swim there. Yeah. What did you think of New Fairfield and Connecticut in general? Um, what did I think of it, or yeah, what do I what think you, of it? What did you and what do you? Um, I didn't love it when I was a kid, because it's boring. But I think everywhere, everyone grows up is boring, probably. <laughs> but uh, I didn't love it when I was a kid, but I do love it now. So what were your parents doing in Connecticut when you were born? Um... My dad has always worked for IBM. I mean, he's retired now. Doing what? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. Do I think a... I have a uh, business. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he was, I think originally he was a programmer, an engineer or something, and then maybe did something more businessy when he was older, but I don't know. Is it because you don't talk with him a lot? Uh, it's like fundamentally kind of not interesting to me. Yeah, <laughs> like, he he worked a lot. Yeah, like all the time. So whatever he did was hard, I'm guessing, <laughs> or consuming. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he wanted us all to really like computers. Like when we were little, we all had like he would get like they don't think they have them anymore, but like like flip computers for kids. And he thought that it was really cool, and we were all like, this is the dumbest, like, leave us alone. <laughs> and what did your mom do? Uh, she was just mom. Cool. But she, before, I think when she first had um, my older brother, she was like a some kind of business lady, and then I think she was also at some point could fly a plane and was also a model. So she had a, a lot of lives, I think, before she had kids. Because my parents waited a couple of years before they had kids. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, I have three brothers, no sisters. Three brothers. Yeah. Uh, and what's your relationship like with them? Um, they're great. Yeah, I get along with all of them. Do they do? Are any of the, them in the arts? No, <laughs> no not at all. Um, my older brother runs a. Uh, he works for a pharmaceutical company, and he runs. I don't know if he runs a robotics lab, but he does like um, genetic testing, I guess, and via robotics and also don't really fully understand um what he does but um then my youngest brother runs the yacht club in our town like the marina in our town um he didn't go to college he went to the navy instead um and then he moved back to town he's worked there since he was like 
12, because uh, he just loves boats. So <laughs> he, like, when he was a little kid, he went there and was like, I just want to hang out here to the owner. And was like, I'll pump gas, I'll do whatever, I won't get in the way. So he's worked there since he was, like, an, adoles uh, an adolescent and, and has continued to, I mean, now basically runs it for this guy. Wow. Um, and is really close with this, this older dude. Um, and then my middle brother, Chip, works at AOL. So a few techie people in your family. Um, yeah, I guess. Wait, which ones? I guess those are all kind of techie. <laughs> well, my, yeah, my younger brother is like a real tinkerer. Like even when he was a little kid, like he would like tinker with stuff. Okay. But he doesn't like tech. And I guess tech, I don't know, it's AOL tech? <laughs> I yeah, guess, I, I, would I, guess, I would call it that. I guess, yeah. It yeah. was in the movie You've Got Mail, I think. It was? I've never seen it. I think... <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, so. I believe it. Um, but yeah, he works uh, there. Yeah. You're the second from youngest? Uh, second from oldest. Second from oldest. Mm -hmm. So upper middle. Uh -huh, cool. Uh, and have they been pretty supportive of you going for this kind of crazy dream? Sure, no one cares. You know, like, I mean, it's everything. It's fine. You know what I mean? It's not really... It's one of those things where... Um, when people ask, like, are your parents supportive? Is your family supportive? I'm like, well, it's sort of irrelevant. Like, <laughs> I don't care. Not not in a bad way, but I think, like, they are. Yeah, of course. They think I'm funny and good and stuff. But they also aren't attuned to certain things. It's the same as I would assume everyone's parents. Where, like, um, if something... Uh, if I'm, like, up for a job that's really big or whatever, they'll be like, well, can... You know, are you going to still do other stuff? I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think they don't have the same vocabulary or yeah. the way that, that this business works. So, um, but yeah, they're always really supportive. My, my, yeah, they're, I'm much harder on myself than they've ever been on me. So, um, they just want me to have health insurance. What I, <laughs> what I do is sort of incidental. Can you tell a couple stories, uh, about like what kind of kid you were growing up? So I was a pretty serious kid, and, I, and the, one of the stories that my parents tell about that, or I was opinionated, um, and I think one of the stories that my parents will tell people about that, um, which I'll tell, is um, they got called into my school, like I got in trouble, and I didn't get in trouble a lot, um, but they got called into my school because my teacher had given us, I think fourth grade, my teacher had given us an assignment to write this thing. I don't even remember what it was, but write something, and then she changed the instruction, and then she changed it again. And apparently, and of course I have no memory of this, so who knows how this has been misappropriated through the years, but um, apparently I gave it back to her and said, like, when you make up your mind about what you want us to do, then I'll do this assignment. But until then, like, you keep changing your mind and it's wasteful of, uh, of time. <laughs> and she got really, really mad at me. <laughs> yeah, because the, you're we're being snarky in a very of course that's like a horrible way. thing for a child to you know it's like incredibly entitled and like um, but my parents they didn't discourage it but they were like yeah I mean he's not wrong um, <laughs> maybe his like attitude needs an adjustment but he's you know we're not gonna like discourage him from thinking independently and sort of challenging authority so. and it sounds like you're being very flaky as a teacher this lady she was a real idiot but yeah I mean you know. I saw her years later working at Macy's. <laughs> you did? Yeah, she worked at Macy's oh, for like the Christmas season. Really work out? Well, no, I think she oh, was still yeah, a teacher. Just Actually, no, she called. <laughs> this is not funny. She ca she called some student by a bad word, and she got fired. Wow. But she always worked at Macy's. She was part time in it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good. So I guess that's a good example of serious. And any other words you think you could use to describe yourself? Is that independent-minded um, or wanted to do my own thing. Um, Any stories about that? Yeah. It's such a, that's such a funny one. <laughs> because I feel like now I couldn't look more not independent-minded, but um, my parents will let me kind of do whatever I wanted, I guess. And even, in, even when I got older, like did the same thing. I never really had any rules. Um, as to what I could and could not do. And so when I was little, I, they would let me dress myself. And I think that's a very common thing for parents to let, um, 
uh, kids do and I would wear my grandpa had this like fishing vest that I would wear all the time and it didn't <laughs> fit me and it was like there was like I think it was down so there was always like shit falling out of it um, and they would ask like when people would ask my parents like why he was doing that or whatever that my response and again I have no memory of this I, <laughs> I don't know why but my response would always be I just have to be me and that they think is like very cute that is cute. Yeah, yeah. Why do you say that you're you seem less independent minded now? No, I say I look less independent. Oh. <laughs> I look like a very conformist sort of person. I think uh, because you're wearing like a crocodile yeah, shirt I right guess. now. Yeah, I just always kind what of. What is this called? Roughly this, the same. This, is a brand. this brand is called Lacoste. Lacoste. Yes. Yeah. What was the earliest sign that you were going to end up like doing what you do now? Um. As a kid, I, I remember being very, like, um, performative, whatever that means as a kid. I think probably all kids have some element of that, but I think I was very, I liked to make people laugh. I liked to tell stories, and I liked to make up stories, um, and play, I guess all kids do, but um, I, I like to, like, reenact things. Were you seen as precocious by your parents and um, other people? Maybe. I, I, that, that, I don't know. What do you mean by that? Like, smarter than average? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. I think, but to me, childhood precocity is like, it, it, it like denotes like a kind of like attitude. I don't think I was a bad kid, but I do think... Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I do think they viewed me as, like, trouble. Like, my... Oh, uh, I don't mean... But I'm, I'm not asking about... Tr I'm saying, like, they think you were smart. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, they, they, like, t almost, like, um, they definitely did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But smart is one of those things where I think it's, like, a little bit unfairly... Like, I think of myself in comparison to my brothers, and I think um, smart a lot of times is, like, a kid gets pegged as smart really early... Um, sometimes that doesn't end up being <laughs> true. Like I was in classes with kids who I know were identified smart when we were young and then it turned out like, eh, maybe they just counted yeah. words quicker and they didn't end up being that bright. Whereas like a couple of my brothers I think got pegged as not that early and it, and they ended up being very bright. So I have a weird relationship with that. <laughs> like childhood identification of intelligence I think is wrong. <laughs> so when was the first time that you ended up saying that you like wanted to go for this career like of being a comedian or actor um well, i did just acting when i was a kid and then when i went to college and more like later in high school i was like but this is not serious like i can't this is like we can't be doing this with our life so you didn't like in college this sales seemed like a pipe dream it was always a big it was always like my secret plan like my not my backup plan, but it was always, like, everything that I was doing seemed like, it was like, okay, I gotta do this, but, like, really, I'm gonna do this other thing. So were you going for something else around then? <laughs> yeah, I went to college for, oh, I always loved politics, and I thought that I would work in politics, um, which is a similar, I think, like, pathology to entertainment, <laughs> um, but yeah, I went to school for government. What made you get into politics? I don't know. I just really, really loved it from a very young age. Um, I I like words a lot. I know that sounds really um, stupid, but I like like the arrangement of words. I like the persuasiveness and the like exacting nature of language. I think is fascinating to me, and always was. Um, and I think maybe that's why I liked it. If I had to peg it now, I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Um, uh, I was just fascinated with it. Uh, did you do extracurriculars in college that had to do with politics? Mm, no, more in high school. And what were those? Like moot court or? No, we didn't have anything. I mean, I did like student government. Yeah. Were you like a president or something? Yeah. You were the president. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Always from middle school on. Yeah. yeah. So you started running in elections when you? It, yeah, in middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and how do you think one might categorize your 
uh, presidency that lasted from middle school. I mean, just a, the, the same as any like what high did you school achieve? presidency. Ineffective. You know, no one does anything. It's a, <laughs> and every year, I feel like every year the same refrain would come up from people who w- were. It was always like this is a popularity contest, which like anyone who's ever gone to high school knows that that's what it is. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. I you know I am sure we did some things. We did some things that, to change. Um, but most of the things that students are interested in that students can actually have an impact in, um, like civically when you're 14, 15 is like, where's the prom going to be? You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't, you're not, what are you, you're going to do a can collection for the homeless shelter? Yeah, of course. But like, you're not revolutionizing the system. Do you remember any part of your like speech that you would make to run for president? Uh, no, I don't. Or like any campaign? Uh, I remember one year there was a, there was a, um, campaign that was like very pointedly against me um <laughs> how do they do that i don't remember specifically what it was but there's these two guys who were very well supported by like the woman who ran the student government um she liked them better than she liked me and again it was maybe because i the same thing is that story that i told earlier of having a little bit of like a not attitude, but a little bit of a sort of like not necessarily the most deferential to authority. She didn't love me, um, and so um, and so she wanted these other two guys to run against me because essentially it was easier for her to work with them than it was for her to work with me because um, I didn't. She like just didn't strike me as someone who should get a lot of respect just because she's a teacher. Yeah. Um, which, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's a bad attitude to have, but she just was sort of underwhelming. <clears throat> yeah, you didn't buy into the authority no. structure. No. Uh, you were class president where you uh, also sort of an overachiever in other yeah. ways. Mm-hmm, for sure. Like what? Um, I always... Um, got really good grades and I was um, president of my class I was president of the National Honor Society I was captain of the swim team any activity that I could do pretty much I did did you uh, look pretty similar to the way you look now? no until I was probably 16 I was really overweight for pretty much my whole life how when you say really overweight how overweight is that? um Pretty big. People think people tease me now of like I that I that it couldn't possibly be true, but or that like that is a thing that I misremember. But like it's not. I was really heavy. Yeah, because you're in really good shape right now. Uh, Oh, thank you. Um, but but it's purposeful. You know what I mean? Like uh, as a kid, I and maybe it also is. Can I'm just maybe realizing this? Maybe it's also connected to that. Um, like sort of. I'm like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like, pushing back against what I'm told to do. Like, I'm just out of control. <laughs> and I weighed, I think, and especially middle school is the worst. Um, and beginning of high school, probably well over 200 pounds for sure. Maybe like 230, 240 on my heaviest. So what inspired you to get into good shape? Well, I was always... But the, the weird thing is, through that whole time, I was competitively swimming. So even that, but I guess maybe it's the one sport where it doesn't affect you. <laughs> I don't know. Doesn't, and also yeah, it's the, to, like right? psychologically the worst because that is the sport also where you wear the least clothes. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, was like kind of horrifying in a like pre-adolescent, adolescent way to be like, great, I'm the fattest kid on this team for sure. Um, and people like when I would compete when you compete in swimming the fastest people go in the middle and then the slower people go on the out so you can on the outer lane so that you can pace and I would get up and I would be on like the one of the middle lanes and I would see I could see people being like laughing and being like no way no way oh no and, but I was good I were you know so um but yeah it I don't know that there was ever a specific decision um I don't remember there being a really big, like, illuminative moment where I was like, I gotta, I gotta get this you under just, control. It was through high school that you yeah. got in good shape. But it was always, I mean, it was a thing that was brought to my attention all the time. Mm-hmm. So, I was aware of it. <laughs> so then you went to college, and mm-hmm. you were a poli, poli-sci major? That uh, was what it it's called government where I went to college. Yeah. Where did mm-hmm. you go to college? I went to Georgetown. Georgetown. Yeah. 
And at Georgetown, you did plays. No. Um, oh, no, you didn't. So no, you no, just no. kept like comedy I in the back did, of your mind. When I was a kid, I did plays and stuff, and like outside of school, like in the community and stuff, and got jobs as uh, as a actor, I guess. Um, I mean, I got paid. Uh, and then, yeah, never in college. So what did your life look outside of class like in college? Um, I worked, um, to pay for, to help pay for school, and, um, I studied, and I partied on it. <laughs> and then you moved to New York from Georgetown? Uh-huh. I moved home for an excruciating six months or something. And <laughs> where you did, where you worked, like, locally? Um... I might have even worked at the beach this summer I graduated. I think I did. And then what brought you to New York? I got a job at a law firm. And how long did you work at that law firm? Um, I signed a two-year contract <laughs> and did not stay with it both years. Because, because I started six months late, by the time that I was supposed to be going to law school, um, it was like half a year off my contract or whatever, and I was like, well, I'm gonna go. And they didn't say anything. So, so you did. You went to law school from there? I did not. Okay. No. And so I started UCB the same time that I was working at that law firm. And was in the law firm in the daytime and then at UCB at night? Mm hmm I tried. Well, in the beginning, I first, I took one class, and that job was, like, really grueling. Like, I worked all the time. Because the deal was, if, if, you, if you worked at this place, they would get you into whatever law school you wanted to go to, right? Not kind of whatever, but it's like they would help you out. They'd give you that extra thing. And I had done well in college um, and felt like I was prepared and I did well in my LSAT. And I felt like, okay, I, I, if I get this extra boost, I can go wherever I want to go. And so I worked really hard and they liked me and I got recommendations and they got me into school. I mean, I got me in, but they helped. Um, and then at the same time I was working at, uh, there, I was taking UCB classes, but it was a lot of time. So even to get the three hours to go to my first one-on-one, I remember telling people like, I'm going to be gone for three hours tonight from seven to 10. I'll, I'll come back after I'll keep working. But those three hours are kind of like, I'll be fully out of pocket. I won't have access to any Blackberry or anything. Um, and it wasn't they weren't super happy about it, but I was like, I kind of just do this. Because I had originally, when I graduated, wanted to go and move here. and To LA. Yes. Always, you know, all of college, I wanted to, I, I would do, like, SNL characters or whatever when I was drunk. You know, I mean, it was people, and people would be like, do that again. Do that. People liked it. And so I wanted to go, to, I was like, I'll go to Groundless because that's what you do. Um, and then I didn't because after I graduated from college, I moved to New York um, for another reason, and then I, so I started taking classes while I was working at that law firm, and then when I finished, when I got in, at the end of that summer, I was in 201 with Joe Wanger, and, um, maybe, maybe it was in 301 at the end of the summer, it might have been 301, um, and I was like, okay, I, I need to defer these law school acceptances, because I like this, and I'm not sure, everyone around me, everyone who was where I was going to be was miserable, truly miserable. Like the things I saw people do and say will, <laughs> uh, will surprise me for the rest of my life. At the law firm? Yes, <laughs> yes. Like grown men and women acting so foolish. Um, and of course they're under incredible duress, you know, they're, there's lots of money on the line and they're responsible. But that acted, that made you be but that was like an aversion to going into that career. Yes, because there was only one normal... Oh, I, no, I shouldn't say that. But there was one person who was like, hey, if you don't have to do this, then don't do it. Um, I know why you are here, because you're like a high-achieving kind of person. But the truth is, like, this is not the only thing that you can do. And if you feel like you can do something else, you should do that. He was like, I have a wife. I have two kids. <laughs> we just put a new kitchen in my apartment. Um, I gotta do this. Like, this is the choice that I've made, but you're, like, <laughs> you don't have to, so... Don't be me? Kind of, not, not really. He was a cool guy, but he, um, he was one of the guys who wrote my recommendations, but he kind of, he was like, just give, just give it an extra thought, dude, um, <laughs> because it's not what you think it is. Um, and, th and that, that, 
turned out to be true. Yeah. So you feel like when you graduated from college, like you had this kind of idea that you might yes. try to do improv, but then you didn't have the complete guts to go for it yet. Yeah, for and sure. Then in, this is the period of time that it kind of clicked in. Yes, I have to go for it. Yeah. Because I took classes and it felt good right away. And I was like, well, I had also taken one improv class at the very end of my college. And I remember, I don't even, I don't remember anything about it, the class, other than like it was fun and I met people who wouldn't normally be in my classes because it was like truly a blow off class. It was called Improvisation for Social Change. Um, and uh, we did a show at the end and I did really well. Like I remember people, out, I remember getting huge laughs in the class. And then I remember afterwards people being like, oh man, you should do this. And I'm like, what, do what? Improvisation for social change? <laughs> what are we talking about? And, but people were like, you should move to New York. You should move to LA. You should do comedy. And I was, which is a thing that I wanted. And then was finally hearing someone who didn't love me say it. You know what I mean? Who didn't know me, wasn't my friend, wasn't under any obligation to be like, hey, great. Yeah. That made me laugh. These are just, you know, some fucking guy who's trying to finish his credits. It's like a sixth year of college. And he's like, hey, man, you're really funny. Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, that made me be like, okay, cool. Um, but I'm not wrong. I, I do think I can do this. So you were going up through classes in New York. Mm -hmm. Did your job change from working at a law firm? I will. When I left, when I, I, so I kept taking classes. I deferred my law school acceptances for one year and I just took classes. And during that time I, I didn't really work cause I had saved a lot of money. Um, and so I eventually did have to get another job. I was like, I'll get a job. I will get a comedy job. No problem. Because I really, like, I took classes. I took writing classes. I took improv classes. I did everything that I could. I was like, I'm going to get my skills, like, solid in this year. And then hopefully I can get a job so I won't have to get another job. I did have to get another job. And I ended up working um, in another business kind of place. Okay. Yeah. And... Can you not say what kind of place it is? Yeah, it was, a, it was a hedge fund. It was half alternative investment advisor, half scientific research company. So my deal with them was uh, I work here and I get to do kind of my own schedule. Like I'll work during the day and stuff, but if I have to leave for an audition, then I'm going to leave. If I have a show at night, I'm going to leave. If I book a commercial, I can't work that day. And, and I'll take less money, much less money than I'm... It's crazy to say I'm worth, but... Uh, then you would pay someone else to do this. Because it was, I worked essentially in a small, they were opening up a new department that was um, government and media affairs. And it was just one head of the department and then me. Um, and so I was like, I'll do this, but I need the flexibility to do this other thing. Because that ultimately is my interest. My interest isn't in developing a career here. Um, and so that's what I did uh, for almost the rest of the time that I was in New York. So when did you make it onto your first team in New York? And what was uh, it? 2010. So several years into, into being in UCB. Did, it, did you like audition for multiple teams and not make it? So, yes. What, how many? So many times. Go into well, detail. They do it more frequently in New York than they do here. It's not annual. They, so I think maybe even one year they did it more than twice. Um, but I auditioned for I think five times without getting on and I got on my sixth time and I got called back every time and some of those were invites and I got invited every time and I never got on. Were you discouraged after so many not getting on? Uh, it got to the point where I was just, people were so encouraging to me. My teachers were so encouraging. People kept being like, it's gonna, you'll get on a team. You just got to hang until there's a spot for you. And you hear that enough times and it just doesn't seem true. Um, and I remember working at my fucking awful job that I didn't, it wasn't an awful job. It was a very good job that I, that I am grateful to have had, um, because I didn't have to like sling drinks or french fries or whatever. Um, but I remember sitting at my desk and being like, fuck, another year, my phone didn't ring. It's never going to happen. Yeah. And it felt terrible and all of my friends by that time all of my friends who were good enough were on teams so you're starting to feel embarrassed about it i felt bad yeah I, I i don't know if i was embarrassed i felt bad and i never was angry i still went to every hair i still always went to the theater and in new york they do a thing and i, I was just in new york last week and uh when they when a lot of times when you finish a herald you bow and i remember like watching my friends do heralds and bowing and hearing their outro music and being like 
That's awesome. <laughs> so cool. Like, they made it. They're doing this fucking and cool thing. And you wanted it so bad. And I did, but in those moments at the end of shows, I, I could never feel any, um, like, I was never resentful. Oh, good. I was just like, fuck, that is cool. Yeah. That is the thing that makes me the happiest. Seeing that thing and, like, being a part of that made me feel really happy. And I actually did a show at the theater before I got on a team. So, which was uh, an improvised soap opera. We did that for a while. And all of those people were on teams. And even when we started, all those people were on teams. And then, so after all the time not getting on teams, I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna do other things to show them that I'm funny because I'm not gonna go away. <laughs> um, so I, then I wrote my own show. And then the same time that I got that show to run, I got on a Herald. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, were people you still know today on that Herald team? Yes. Uh, yeah, all of them. Um, I saw some of them when I was back in New York. Um, and we are much better friends than we ever were a team. We were um, pretty terrible. But yeah, some people live in a Half of us live here now. What was um, that team called? It's called Monstra. Oh, so that was like Sarah Claspell was on that team. and Sarah Claspell. And Beth. Beth Appel. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Black, who lives here now. And then the other four guys live in New York still. <laughs> we were awful. At that time in your life, like, did you feel like your dream was like just to like do more and more stuff at UCB or like it was all, it was still like get on SNL someday or something. Uh, like yeah, that. it was still, I think still in my mind that was uh, a goal, but it was also, no, my goal was never to be like deeply, my goal was never like, how could I get on a weekend team? I never thought about that. It's so funny now because I never thought about the things that I think the people around me were thinking about at that time. Like when I was on that terrible team, I now know that a lot of my teammates were thinking like, oh no, we're going to get cut. I was not thinking that. I was never worried what about What were you that. thinking? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I remember thinking this is frustrating, but I don't remember thinking, oh God, we'll get cut. This will be the end of my upper. Mm -hmm. It just didn't enter my mind. I remember thinking it was fun. I liked seeing them and hanging out with them. And I was on the kind of ride of my life. Like we had a great year. We hung out together all the time and it felt so different than the life that I had before that I, I, I don't know that I ever looked that far ahead. So what was the path from there to <laughs> moving out to LA? So I, that, I wasn't, after I got on a team, I actually wasn't there for that long. <laughs> I was probably there for another year and a half. Um, so I was got on a team, that team got broken up. I got on another team that was very, very good, which was lucky. It was like a bunch of real veterans and I still had been on Harold Knight less than a year. Um, we got very good, so it was a really different experience. Because that first team, we hung out all the time. We truly spent several days a week together. And the second team, we picked our song, we did our first rehearsal, we took our picture all within hours of our first practice. Like everything was done. There was no like, hey, when are we going camping? Like there was, it just wasn't that way. But we were very, we did eventually get very good. Um, but they were like, we're gonna practice before Harold Night on Tuesday because we want to be able to have it be, a, this thing be a one day commitment. And I was like, no, this is not. This, <laughs> it just felt very different. So that team was going well. Um, I, my show ran for almost a year. What was the idea of this show? It was insane. It, um, and I, I'm very grateful to Anthony King for uh, running it. Uh, it was actually, it was directed by Shannon O'Neill, who's now the artistic director in New York. And, uh, it was, a, called Men in Paintings. And it was a, um, a journey through this hall of portraits. Um, this kid, his whole family dies in a, in a hot air balloon crash trying to race around the world. And he has to um, prove something, I forget what it is, uh, but he has to prove something by going through this hall of portraits and he's guided by this obese caretaker who's trapped in the attic. And so that was a character that was like all the, um, <laughs> like the, the transitions between the characters was this guy on video, which was just me covered in pizza. Um, <laughs> it was great. And like a big Jesus beard. Uh, and eat. And so basically it was like, I would interact with that video and then I would change and do a character. And so that was uh, really fun and crazy and um it was also the first time that my parents came to the theater and saw me which was cool and were they supportive right then 
and excited about it? Uh, they, I, they were like, they were really cool. They really liked that show. Um, which it was very weird. People left that show because it was weird. Um, it was. I maintain that it was very funny, but I know that it wasn't for everyone. Like people actually walked walked out. Uh, yes, the first time the two. But I mean, to, not like regularly, but the two people sitting in front of my parents the first time left, and they were like, <laughs> "Why did they leave? It was so good." Uh -huh. um, and it got. I I got it mentioned in the New York Times, and so that I think made them be like, "Okay, cool. Um, this is like he's doing okay." Um, and then, so all that was happening, and I felt great. And I was like, okay, I gotta go. And so I moved to LA. And you gotta go, because what did you think LA would do for you? Um, I wasn't thinking like, oh, it's great. It's time for me to leave and, and get famous. But I was thinking, hey, it's time for me to move and like challenge myself again. Because to like try to audition for things yeah, and stuff. Yeah, because I was in New York, I was auditioning, but there's not a lot of work. Like I, you know, I auditioned for 30 Rock or whatever little TV things. So whatever TV things exist, then I was auditioning for them. I was taking casting directing workshops. I was auditioning for commercials. I had an agent. Um, and I was just feeling like, okay, the the ceiling here is is not high enough that I can stay here. And I'm very comfortable. So I quit my job. I moved into an apartment that was too small for me to live in that I, would make me very unhappy with the thought that I'm going to be here for six months. Um, and then I'm gonna move to LA because I was too comfortable. And when you moved, how long did it take you to get comfortable out here? Um, pretty quickly. I start. I tried to start doing things right away. Um, I tried to meet with Neil pretty quick, and he was like, "Cool. I mean, you sound funny, but like, there's a lot of people already here, you know." Um, but was very cool, and and I, I pitched him an idea for a show that I wanted to write, and then I wrote that, and I was like, I gotta show these people that I'm funny now, because you don't like pour it over immediately. Was that your TED Talk show? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Which is, can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, it's just a bunch of fake TED Talks. It's a day at a fake TED conference. So same as in New York, although a much more abridged period of time, it was less than a year, but when I moved here, I was like, okay, fuck it, like, the auditions aren't until next year for team, for Harold and Maude, so I, um, I was like, I gotta do something in the interim, so I wrote that show, um, put it up, and it ended up getting on that team the, for my first Harold team in New York and having that show run all again within the same week. So you, it, it was like your first Harold team in LA was in 2012 at the end of that year yeah. mm -hmm. was Cooper. Mm -hmm. And then Cooper was around for like a year and mm -hmm. then you got on JV. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then JV became like a house team a yeah. couple of years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this just was last November. It's cool that you hadn't been so hyper focused on like making it onto a house team someday and then got mm -hmm. to in this very cool way make it onto J V and have mm -hmm. that become a house team. Uh, do you feel generally like validated in your decision to move out to LA? Sure, yeah. I I I moved here and I started I got jobs, like not right away, but within the first couple months I booked my first job here. And which which is oh, great. Um, a taco commercial, <laughs> um, and yeah, it just felt like, oh, cool. Like this, the, the, and who, you know, you can't fucking live on a taco commercial for the rest of your life, but it did feel like, oh, geez, this is not completely, um, implausible that I could continue to like accrue more of these and eventually move on to something better and, and getting onto that team. I mean, everything that's happened to me at UCBLA has been Amazing. I'm even even that first team getting broken up was that was also a very good year because it was the first year that I moved here, so it felt like oh great immediately I have new friends because <laughs> I didn't know that many people. I mean, the, most of the people my generation from New York weren't here um, I, because I came for no reason. I didn't move here with a job, um, and so people thought I was insane. Yeah, and so it felt really nice to be able to not feel so insane because I was like maybe they're right I don't know. <laughs> uh, w have you booked other commercials other than that taco commercial since you <laughs> moved here I know you you got to do it <laughs> this seems like a ridiculous question no but did I you got to do that campaign for Sky Vodka right uh -huh. what, was uh -huh. that the next commercial you booked or no there are a couple in between I did a I've done a commercials that don't show in, in America which is the great um, that happens to you regularly? I, it has, yeah. Why do you think that is? I don't know. 
Is it, do, well, you, <laughs> English isn't your only language, right? I speak Italian. Uh, fluently. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I mean, also, well, but really not anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> so have you spoken Italian in commercials? mm Okay, so mm-hmm. it just, you, it just so happens that you I don't have know. a look that I don't know. gets you cast in international commercials. Not, I mean, it hasn't been a ton, but I've gotten to, I've gotten to, yeah, do stuff that, first of all, like, there's one that's not even in English. So oh, I have no weird. idea why they needed me. <laughs> uh... Is Sky Vodka the commercial that most people saw you in? Uh, yeah, that that ran a lot. I think that yeah, that's the one that like people from high school were like, "Hey, I, I saw you on Mad Men." And I was like, "Well, I wasn't on that, so I know what you're talking about." Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, did they get confused and just think that no, the no, commercial no. ran in Mad Men? It <laughs> was part of the Mad Men episode. No, I don't know. <laughs> but that's the one that I heard from people who hadn't heard from for a while. Uh, uh, some of the other ones. No, it is my, yeah, that one is probably the most. And of like TV things you auditioned for, what's been most exciting to you to get to shoot? To get to shoot? Like you've you've done roles on like Playing House and uh, Children's Hospital and Key mm-hmm. and Peele. Mm-hmm. Like w- what were uh, any of those that stand out of like a really exciting day shooting that? Uh, they were all really fun. They were all, I mean, it's all like... Any job you get feels like, fuck, this is so unlikely. Great. Um, so it's always fun. Um, I mean, always. That's a small handful of examples. But I have liked them all. Uh, but Children's Hospital was great. Because um, I really shot that the same day that I did those vodka commercials. Um, That's a fun day. For, yeah, it was great. Um, Fernie, Alex Fernie directed that. So I assume that's how I got that job. Um, and the scene was with Megan Mullally. So it was, that was really fun. Because, uh, first of all, everyone who works there was so cool and nice. And when I first, when I did the first line, because they don't fucking know me, probably Fernie was just like, he'll be able to do this and it's fine. Um, and they were like, yeah, how, could he, how bad could he fuck it up? So I did the first line and everyone laughed. And that's like fucking David Wayne and Megan Mullally. You know, like people who, again, it's like have no reason to laugh other than it's funny. Um, and that felt great. Um, and then continued to laugh and, and were very nice to me uh, about how well it had gone. And it was just a quick little scene. Um, but Megan Mullally was complaining during it. She was like, oh, I feel like I'm so much better when the camera's off. <laughs> uh, and which I thought was funny. And so when they wrapped me, and I was leaving, she was like, nice to meet you, you're really funny, don't be a stranger, or whatever. Um, and I was like, oh, it was nice to meet you too, and you were so funny when the cameras were off. Um, and she looked at me, it had been, enough time had elapsed between when she said that, and it was also the kind of thing that she kind of said like to no one, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, and then enough time had elapsed since she sh- said that, that I'm not sure that, I'm sure she remembered it, but it, it took her a second, and in that second, I was like, I'm a, I'm a fool. <laughs> like, yeah. What have I done? <laughs> and then there was a beat, and then she laughed. And I was like, okay, good, good, good. You came very close it. to ruining your career. Yeah, I, well, I mean, who knows? She but, could poison your name <laughs> across LA. Maybe, but she was cool. She was really cool, and being able to make people like that laugh was great. Um, but, you know, I got greedy on the way out. It sounds like she made Bill Hader's career originally. Oh, and, that story and, is amazing. And so yeah. she, she probably, did not do that. She probably could have, like... yeah done the opposite to you yeah maybe i don't know but that that was that was really fun and it was uh that was a cool experience yeah and fernie was a great director any jobs that you've had in the last few years that were especially terrible uh yeah i so i've never had to get another full-time job since I left New York, right? Since those six months where I was like, okay, this is not my life anymore. I'm not going to do this. And I made that kind of commitment to myself. So when I moved here, um, and then I just lived off the money that I had saved and coaching and stuff, which is a thing that I just started doing right before I moved. And then when I moved here, I tried to get set up with coaching and stuff like that. And then um, I tutored SATs, which I really didn't like. What didn't you like about it? Um, everything. <laughs> I just didn't like it. You have to you have to drive all around the city, and it's usually to like 
Beverly Hills or somewhere nice and then some of the kids were really cool but some of the kids like also didn't care and they'd be like I didn't do my homework and I'd be like okay well I don't know what the fuck you want from me like it's your life son like <laughs> I cannot possibly be interested in your future if you're not because like my skin in the game here is so negligible compared to yours so if you don't want to do this or if it doesn't seem interesting to you hey, we're in the same boat. If you want to do it and work hard and get better, cool, cool, cool. Like, you will get so much better and you will, you know, have more options available to you. Um, but it was not my favorite. I'm not, like, a... But then I do like... I do like, like... Some kids I did really like. The same as, like, teaching or coaching improv or sketch. Like, I do like some people and it feels like... I can really make a difference here. And then some people was like, well, you thought that was funny? And you're going to fucking fight me on that? I'm telling you, no one laughed. So, or it's the same with, with, like, with tutoring, where the kid would argue, like, hey, this works. And it's like, really? Because you got the wrong fucking answer. <laughs> so why are we having this conversation? I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm telling you, this didn't work, and here's how you can course correct in order to get to the place that you want to go. And so it's really frustrating. It, that was just so frustrating. And that coupled with like driving to these houses and, and then having to go to auditions and then having to do whatever other bullshit stuff that I had to do, just some days felt like, what the fuck am I doing? I love that analogy between uh, somebody arguing for their wrong answer in SATs and for their wrong joke choice in a, like, <laughs> improv. It, it's it's interesting that, like, you would think that it would well, be a little bit more open-ended with improv. There's no right or wrong. That, but there but there kind of is sometimes. Sure. What's you know, outcome? if somebody wants to make, like, right. a, like, if they think the funny thing is that they're calling, like, a lady a bitch right. in a scene, right. then, like, they're wrong. Yeah. It's the outcome. It's like, well, did people laugh at that? Like, I know you thought it was funny because I watched you like it. Um, but I also watched everyone else in here, um, you know, recoil. So let's talk about why that is. Because sometimes people aren't aware of it. Sometimes people are not aware of things like that. Like, I mean, you would be so surprised if you're just honest with people. Like, on my first Herald team, there was a guy who just talked so much. He asked so many questions. He talked so much about what he thought improv was supposed to be and it was getting on people's nerves and I was like hey man did you realize you're taking up some of our rehearsal time with your thoughts and, and it's it's kind of putting people back on their heels and he said no he did it it's not because he's a bad guy sometimes people just <laughs> are not aware of the way that they behave affects other people so you know it can be helpful to have a f candid and frank conversation yeah but oh yeah those tutoring days were, were not good and I don't have to do it anymore, which I... And I'm so... That was, like... And, again, I feel so dumb complaining about it because four jobs? Come on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you sit with some fucking kid for an hour and a half and they give you a good amount of money and then, you know, you don't have to put on a suit and go to some building every day. <laughs> it's not bad. Pretty good. Day to day, how much confidence do you have that, like, you you're going to get to where you want to get in your career and how much of the time do you feel like it might be 10 years from now and you don't feel a lot farther? Um, day to day. I, don't I think I'm saying this up in such a No, you're way. not. You're not. I, I understand the, I understand the sort of nature of what you're asking, which is essentially like I am, uh, uh, nervous about it all the time, but also like I can't, it's just too indulgent to think like that. I think it's just too indulgent. What's indulgent about it? Oh, th to like because even like, say that you... Because what the fuck are you doing? You just, will even make it? No, to say that you won't. Or to like, or to cry in your car because you just went into something and someone was awful to you or someone gave you notes on a script that was like this is garbage um what are you doing it's just indulgent to be like no it's not what am i doing this is crazy i have those thoughts all the time but like to nurse them and encourage that it's just like well 
it's that thought is just as irrational as the thought of like I can do it. <laughs> so why not feed the good one? It's that that you know that stupid fucking thing feed which uh, you know what I'm talking about the Indian thing the one you feed or whatever. <laughs> not really, but it sounds. There's good. some story of like there's two wolves in every person, like one evil and one good, and the kid asks like which one survives and. And the Indian chief, this is awful, it might not be Indian. Uh, but the the Native American chief says, like, whichever one you feed. And so I think that's true. It's like, if you feed those negative indulgent thoughts and, like, compare yourself to everyone all the time, which is a thing that everyone does, and I do, it's not, it's a true, true waste of time. Have there been any periods of time that you felt, like, especially full of doubts out here? I think like after a spate of good things happens, you know, you're like, this is what my life will be like. And then nothing happens. And it's awful. You know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think like the first year that I, that I lived here, I had saved a bunch of money from when I moved. And I was like, my first year, I do not get a job. And I just write and create and do stuff. And my first goal was write that show. My second goal was write a spec and an original pilot and a screenplay. And that was like, okay, if I can do that, that will make me happy this year. And I did them and then, uh, sent them around and like <clears throat> asked friends to pass them to their agents and blah, blah, blah. And no response. And so that felt pretty bad. Um, and also was like, fuck it. If no one's going to take these, then I'm going to like send them to competitions. I'll send them to like, uh, program, like writing programs at studios. I'll do, and I did all of that. Nothing. And that felt pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I go back and read some of that stuff and I'm like, yeah, they're not wrong. I mean, I never got any direct feedback, but it's also like, yeah, I think I've made, I've revisited all those things and they're better now. How much of, is being a writer a thing you want to be versus being an actor? Um, both, yeah. I mean, I don't have a preference for either, I think. Um, it's weird, because when I first started at UCB, I feel like there was a distinction made between the two, which <laughs> may not have been any institutional infrastructure. It may have just been <laughs> psychologically on my part. I'm like, these people are writers, these people are actors. And when I was able to write a show of my own that made me feel like the compliments that I got on that show a lot of them were or feedback uh, a lot of it was like I was surprised that that writing was so good and that made me feel like oh great I'm also a writer so everyone can um, you know that distinction just feels like that's fucking stupid <laughs> yeah. and when people tell like even really talented friends that we have that we know like I've had several people be like well I'm not a real writer and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, why would you shortchange yourself like that? You are writing on your feet all the time. Like, you, you think because you didn't write a fucking, you, can't, you aren't a monologue joke writer for Jimmy Kimmel, you're not a writer? No, you are. And I, I hate it when people sell themselves short and drive me crazy. <laughs> what does a typical week look like for you? Like, can you just go through a week? Um... I don't know that there is, like, I don't have really a typical week. I guess I structure my time as much as I possibly can. So um, I usually have auditions most of the week, and then I coach, um, occasionally teach. Um, I try to do my writing in the morning if I'm working on something, and I try to always be working on two or three things. what kind of things are you working on right now? Um, so right now I'm fixing up a pilot that I wrote that I kind of like went out and pitched and I'm writing a new one and, uh, I'm actually not writing the, with the, Madeline and I are working on getting a couple of days shot on the series that we wrote. That's really good. Oh, thanks man. We're, uh, very pleased with it. I think writing it was really easy and fun, but uh, we'll, we'll meet to kind of like punch it up and be like, no. Nah. We like this. Yeah, it just made me laugh so much to read it. Good. Yeah, it comes from a real place. So I hope people like it, and I hope we get to finish it soon. But yeah, I try to do all that stuff. So th those, like, any pilot stuff that I'm writing, any, like, longer form stuff that I'm writing, I try to do that block time in the morning before I do anything else. Like, 
that's what I have to do before I get to do what I want to do. Because, you know, with our kind of life, you can do what you want to do a lot more than most people. Um, and so I try to keep the balance. I try to keep a balance. And I don't just do whatever I want. I, like, wake up and try to do that work first. And then I revisit it later in the day if, if I have time. But always structure that time into my day so that I don't feel like, geez, I'm not doing this. Because I think... A lot of people complain a lot about nothing's happening and nothing's going forward in their life and I don't really see them putting in the effort. Um, and so if I want the ability to <laughs> bemoan uh, what's going on, then I, I have to combat it by having some actual work. If that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah, it does. How much does your life look today like you thought it would look like when you were growing up? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, no. No, not even close. So what are the differences? Um, I never expected that I would have to worry about money. Or that I wouldn't have everything that I wanted. <laughs> and so that's weird. Um, just because I figured like I would make the choices that I was going to make and that that would always set me like to, I see the lives that some of my friends from college live and they are what I thought my life would look like. But would you actively choose the life you have right now? No, because I know what it costs. Oh, you, you would not choose. No. Because no, I your know life. I would choose my life. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, yes, yes, yes. No, but I know what the cost of that life is because I'm not going to say I lived it, but I, I started, you know? And so knowing the way that I felt and the, the way that it made me feel, the unhappiness that I felt in that place of looking just a step ahead and saying like, oh, I can be this person who has this like incredible career um, in either like law or finance or whatever it is and know that like w what the actual like psychic cost of that is, is something that I'm not willing to pay. Um, so it's scary to not have that. It really is because that is just based on where I come from and, and, and what I thought my life would look like, to not have that is probably my m biggest embarrassment. Not an embarrassment, but it does feel like, oh shit. Maybe this isn't working, <laughs> you know? But I've learned to have, that there are just a million other factors involved in, in what makes a life, and I think that is good. Because um, it makes me feel like I have a better understanding of what kind of person I want to be. And I think the other version is that as like a cartoonish, it's like watching a movie and being like, that should be my life. Um, and I think I would find that un satisfactory there's, there's a this is dumb but there's like a there's an ask up it's Gerald quote that I love that reminds me of this which is like he's one of his books has the line um it was always the dreaming it was always the dreaming of becoming that he loved not the being and I feel like that's I'm not I'm not getting that quote exactly right but the sentiment of it is like do you want to be that person or do you want to become that person does that make sense? Yeah. And that feels to me so resonant to sometimes you see something and you're like, oh man, great, what a life. And then you're like, no, you don't want to fucking be that guy. You don't want to be that woman. Like, that's not what you really want. You just, I think, as I've gotten older, developed more of an appreciation for um, the complexity that's involved in, in all of everyone's decisions and why certain people are in the position that they're, they're in and, and what that means without being humble what is your hope for where you are five years from now um i hope that it's not a hope that it like <laughs> this is a weird way to answer that but i would like it to be hope to me is like not what i'm dealing in 
at this point. <laughs> I'm dealing in like the reality of what I want and not what I'm like dreaming of. Uh, which I know sounds crazy, but it's also more like, fuck it, I don't, I don't know, the, the like, it just seems so much more equivocating to be like, someday this will come true. It's like, no, fuck, this is what I want, and like, I will make this happen. Um, I would like to have, to be in a show that I write, um, I like to have other writing projects going on. I'd still like to perform at UCB and do stuff that I love with people that I love, but I would like to have um, some some things in production that are uh, that I'm in charge of. Like on TV? Know. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, yeah. I think I could do that. I think I'd be good. I think so. I think I'd be good at it. <laughs> um, so, and that's just a matter of, I think, you know, incremental progress all around. Um, but yeah, I'm not... That, was that a crazy answer? No. Was it crazy to that's be... That's great. I, I just, to me, I like everyone that I know has been doing this long enough where it's like, what are you, you're fucking dreaming of that? Like, you choke on a cop. You just do it. <laughs> like it dri- like one thing that drives me crazy is I had a conversation with someone that in our community where it's like yeah we just gotta wait for like our the like the person from our generation that's like um, Lennon and Jess or or you know whoever and I was like no you don't wait for that you're gonna you're right. waiting for one of your friends to get successful so they'll get you a job yes yes of course if your friend is successful and they can get you a job wonderful I've benefited from that like but. You don't. I, that it, <laughs> very good things make me actually angry. It, that drove me insane. To to think like that's how you conceptualize your life. You can't think like I want to be that person. I'll take that ownership. I'll take that control over like my own future instead of like, geez, I hope like one of my super talented smart friends does something good so that I don't have to keep being a fucking idiot all the time. <laughs> like what? Really? That's your hope. So that's why the, the like framing of that it's not has nothing to do with like I have nothing against hopes and dreams. But I do have this weird reaction to people being like, Oh geez, like stars fall where they may. But I do feel I do believe in that. Like I do I'm like if you do a good job at something and it doesn't work, like you can only you can only be satisfied with yourself. Because you like worked hard enough. Uh, thinking of this show as like a time capsule, mm. what is some advice you'd like to give to you 30 years from now, uh, just to make sure like it's still a thing in your head? Don't, I mean, I probably, everyone just says this, but like, don't be too hard on yourself. Like I'm really... Just like you're, you're you're okay, you're fine, um, and it'll be fine, um, and you're better than you give yourself credit for, I think. And remember that you do this because you wanted to have fun, and to make people happy, and to love your life, and hopefully, that's a thing that you never lose sight of, um, because even. I think that's a very easy thing to lose sight of when you get successful, and I think that's a thing that I would hope that old me would still have of like, man, that's fun. I'm surrounded by people that I really like, um, and that's on purpose. People that I like who are fucking great at what they do, um, and make my life better. And so if your life isn't like that, you're not doing it right. So you better get back to it. I think that's great advice. I don't know if it is. I feel like a lot of people, <laughs> like, you see a lot of people who are really successful lose track of it. It's like, I think it is easy to be like, this job is hard and stressful and I have to go to set at 5 o'clock in the morning when someone's like, people fucking blow leaves for a living. Like, and that's not to say, like, that they don't love their lives too, but, like, if I had to get up every day and blow leaves for a living, I, I would not be happy. Maybe I would. <laughs> uh, but you know the point I'm trying yes. to make. that It's just like, there are way worse fucking things. Like, that's your problem? Yeah. 
there are way worse problems to have. And hopefully, if you choose... You get to choose the life you want. So... Love it. That's crazy. So many people that I know did not choose the life that they wanted. They choose... They chose a life that someone encouraged them to have, and that's made a minimal impact on their ability to live how they want. It doesn't have to be like that. You can choose to do whatever you want. And when I see people doing it, it makes me so happy. And it feels like watching, <clears throat> like, have a niece and nephew. And I'm like, fuck, you can, you can do whatever you want. So when people will encourage them not to do things or not to be a certain way, it's like, no, you learn all that stuff, right? Like someone tells you like reading is good. People who don't read are not smart or something. You know what I mean? That's a bad example. Um, and it's like, if you don't like to fucking read and you like to do something else, great. Be the best at that thing. You get to make that choice that, that makes me uh, very happy. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Great. This was really fun. Cool. Good. This was fun. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Paul Welsh. If you want to see Paul perform live, you can see his improv team JV perform every Friday at 11 at UCB Franklin in Los Angeles. If you like this episode of On the Cusp, uh, I hope you'll consider rating or reviewing the show on iTunes. When people review the show, it genuinely means a lot to me, and it makes it more likely that people might find the show in the future. So think about doing that and making my day. Special thanks to Marcy Giro for talking to me at the beginning of this episode, to Hi-Ho Silvero and Casey Trila for all the music of this episode, to Joe Burge, my sound editor, and to my producer, Cece, I can has a friend Olympics win in two boars, Pierce. This has been On the Cusp. Be-ne-ne, 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 be-ne-ne. That's your outro music. <laughs>